<laughs> okay. Good morning, Dr. Cole. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. How are you, Rich? I'm fantastic. Always good to see you. Um, to see you. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. I'd like to introduce Dr. Wendy Cole. Uh, she practices in Northeast Ohio, where she serves as medical, medical director of the Wound Care Center, University Hospitals Medical Center, and adjunct professor and director of wound care research at Kent State University College of Podiatric Medicine. That's a <laughs> <medical school. laughs> I know. Used uh, to be well, Ohio College of po Now it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, All right. Let's see if I could share my screen. You guys can see everything. Yeah, load it up first. I could see you. Mm -hmm. yeah, perfect. Awesome. Good. Yeah, okay. All right. a little hide. I yeah. am. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thanks to Tom for kicking off this event. Uh, I know you got a lot of uh, pertinent pearls from his talk. And I'm going to lead you down the patient journey and how topical oxygen therapy can really support pain management in a chronic wound care patient. So disclosures, I am a member of the Speakers Bureau for Organogenesis, and I am the Global Medical Affairs Director for Natrox Wound Care. Um, the objectives for this talk are to discuss the negative effects of wound pain on our patients and their quality of life, provide an overview of wound pain. We will examine the negative effects of opioids, not just for, you know, the patient itself, but for wound healing, I think that's a little known fact. So we'll dive into that as well. And we'll explore the effect of topical oxygen therapy on patient outcomes, but also to support uh, pain management in chronic wound patients. So really, when a patient has a non-healing chronic wound, it significantly impacts pretty much every aspect of their life, right? And, and takes a toll on their quality of life. The wound controls much of their daily routine. They have clinic appointments, tests, bandage changes, maybe daily, maybe several times a day or several times a week. And this could take uh, chunks of time, many hours over many weeks of therapy. And a lot of times patients will tell you that they become depressed because they can't really do the activities they love to do. They might not be able to swim or go for a walk because of uh, the exudate and pain that their wound inflicts on them. And, and those are the activities that they use to cope with anxiety and depression and pain and stress. And so that's really sets up this, this cycle uh, of this chronic pain, depression, and really, you know, decreased quality of life. And we know that pain is one of those symptoms that patients living with chronic wounds find particularly distressing. So we know that pain occurs after tissue injury, right? It's our protective role. It's it's what uh, signals kind of that fight or flight mechanism in us. It alerts the body that there's uh, impending damage or da damage so that we could hopefully remove the stressor, but then also allows the body to know that there's been some tissue damage. So it signals the repair uh, process and the healing cascade. In chronic persistent pain, that pain that's over seven weeks in time, uh, this physiologic kind of processes might be compromised and wound healing or tissue repair and regeneration actually stalls. And we know that our patients live with these chronic wounds for many, many weeks, uh, many months, and, and sometimes, you know, many years. I've had patients that have had chronic wounds for 15 years or more. And, you know, this chronic pain can oftentimes be a, a, a disease of their own, of its own rather, if we don't manage it properly. I think that unfortunately there's some provider uh, unawareness uh, that really this pain affects so many parts of our patients' lives and has a decrease in their quality of life, but we're getting better. You know, we're, we're assessing pain as part of the daily uh, assessments for our patients and our weekly wound care assessments. Uh, we're understanding the pathophysiology of pain and how it decreases the functionality of the patient, the pathophysiology that it creates in the wound itself. So I think we're getting better, but there's a lot we don't know still. 
But, you know, if we don't manage this properly as healthcare providers, it can lead to psychosocial issues. Patients are embarrassed to go out in public. Uh, they have physical limitations. They have this chronic pain. Again, it, it's just this whole cycle that will lead to isolation, depression, and a decreased quality of life. And many patients with chronic wounds suffer from moderate to severe pain. So the vast majority of patients have some sort of wound pain. And about half of those that have wound pain, they relate that that's moderate to severe. So it's not just, you know, a little tinge or twinge here and there. It's, it's significant pain that's limiting their ability to uh, perform their activities of daily living and really have joy in their life. And also, we know when patients' quality of life decreases, their long-term health outcomes also decrease. So quality of life is linked to decreased healing and then also increased levels of amputation, believe it or not. So it's, it's, it's a big deal. We need to understand it better. We need to recognize it in our patient populations. And we have to leverage therapies that treat it without um, adverse events and, and improper outcomes. So let's talk about when do patients experience pain? So we talked about, you know, during activities, walking, you know, there might have limitations in, in their ability to do uh, their exercise routines, go grocery shopping, go to church, spend time with their family. But significant pain can be felt for the patient during dressing changes as well. And dressing removal tends to be uh, the most time that the patient experience, experiences pain, um, closely followed by wound cleansing and then wound debridements as well. But we could do a lot, and, and there are some pearls we'll talk about, how we can uh, effectively manage pain around dressing changes. And, and typically we see it when dressings have dried out and uh, we try to remove those dry dressings. And that significant pain can be felt in the patient for 60 to 90 minutes after dressing changes. And, and this truly can cause what we might perceive as non-adherence with the patient, you know, gosh, that patient didn't change their dressing or gosh, that patient didn't come in for their wound care visit. And it's not that they don't want to be adherent and they don't want their wound to heal, but, you know, maybe those dressing changes cause significant pain and, and maybe coming into our clinics and, you know, we do our cleansing and our debridement and it causes them significant pain and we're not realizing that. So they aren't uh, as apt to make those appointments because they're scared and, and they don't particularly like the pain. So different ulcers can be linked to different types of pain and uh, typically leg ulcers rank among the most painful wounds that patients will experience uh, swell, followed by superficial burns. And then, you know, all wounds can have pain, infected wounds, pressure injuries, cuts, abrasion, fungating wounds. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's pain descriptions that are tied with the different various types of wounds. Venous leg ulcers, we see aching and having in the feet, arterial ulcers, cramping or spasms, pressure injuries, we get irritation or inflammation, and diabetic foot ulcers. Although we say the patients are neuropathic and maybe don't feel pain, they, they do actually. They have burning, tingling, and shooting pains, those neuropathic pains uh, because of nerve injury. So those can be significant as well. Two types of pain, uh, the gnosis Receptive pain, it's when there's that mechanical or thermal excitation of the peripheral nerve. So this is our, our typical pain, right? You know, you, you burn yourself with your curling iron, which I did not too long ago, or get taking um, something out of the oven. Uh, that's that's this type of pain. Or somebody, you know, you, you cut yourself or you, you know, stub your toe. Um, and this type of pain is our ordinary process of that stimuli, damages tissues, and then there's this constant conscious perception of pain that runs through uh, the nervous system and goes to the brain. And this type of pain is usually responsive to pain medications. Now that neuropathic pain that we relate to like diabetic ulcers or diabetic foot disease is that burning and pins and needles. And, and it's not that we encounter a stimuli that causes pain. It's actually a malfunction of the central peripheral 
peripheral nervous system. And uh, it's caused by the disease state, diabetes, there can be other disease states that cause nerve damage. But this type of, of pain, wound pain, really doesn't respond well to opioids or analgesics, uh, medications that you could take orally. And this can persist, persist for years and years. So wound pain, though, is really sometimes a combination of that. And it makes it more difficult because patients will experience altered sensations, the two types of pain we discussed. But then they have inflammation, tissue damage, hypoxia, infection. So they have a whole host of things that are contributing to wound pain. And even some of the lightest sensation, uh, like air or change in, in water temperature, can really exaggerate the response response that they're feeling and wound complications like maceration or infections, ischemia, like we talked about, really will increase the pain that they're feeling in their wound. So how do we treat this effectively? Well, you know, a lot of us uh, that have practiced in podiatry or medicine in general uh, and have done surgery, uh, we know the dosing ladder by the World Health Organization and, and how to use opioid and non-opioid analgesics. But again, not all pain that is wound related will respond to, to analgesics. And this is the, the WHO analgesic dosing ladder. We have different steps based on the, the pain score that you you, uh, get from your patient. Unfortunately, you know, even though opioids are used to treat pain, we know that opioids are addictive and there's a lot of complications that we won't go into. Uh, but opioids also negatively impact wound healing. And this is quite interesting. I don't know that people are aware of that. We know that they're addictive and, and we know that patients can overdose and we know that they can cause GI issues with our patients. We know that. Um, but are we really aware of how much it can impact wound healing? It reduces when opioids reduce uh, immune activation, impact tissue oxygenation and angiogenesis. They alter the myofibroblast recruitment, a keratinocyte and cytokine production, and really decrease the healing cascade. So it will limit the endothelial proliferation and angiogenesis. And these are crucial parts uh, of the wound healing cascade. And if we don't, you know, have these functions of tissue repair and regeneration occurring, then these wounds become stalled. So we're treating a chronic wound that's painful, that's been open a long time with opioid medications that will contribute to that patient being that wound being stalled and open and chronic. So there's really an unmet need of wound care treatments that support wound healing by helping to manage wound pain as well. So we're going to talk about topical oxygen and how topical oxygen therapy could hopefully fill that gap. So physiologic features of chronic wounds that can affect oxygenation in the tissue and really set up a hypoxic environment or there's high metabolic activities uh, when wounds are injured, right? There's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of cells that need to be activated, cytokines, growth factors that need to be, uh, you know, released from, from active cells. We need cellular replication. We talked about angiogenesis or new blood vessel formation. So there's a lot of activity and all of those activities are heavily oxygen dependent. Edema can also stop that uh, infusion of oxygen into the tissues. A lot of our patients, our diabetic patients, patients with PAD have poor microcirculation. So they're not getting the oxygen through the blood system to the wounded tissues to meet this increased demand. There's sometimes diffusion constraints because we've had tissue loss because of that edema. And then if wounds are contaminated with bacteria, bacteria need oxygen to continue to live and replicate. So sometimes if we have a high level of bacteria in a wound, they'll kind of gobble up the available oxygen so that it's not available for the cells, for the tissues, for that repair and that regeneration. So there's a lot of problems uh, in our patients uh, that have chronic wounds that really set up this hypoxic environment. So we talked about poor blood circulation, edema, injured tissue. Uh, 
And uh, all of these processes really need oxygen to function properly. So oxygen plays a role of oxidative killing of bacteria. And Dr. Schultz in his talk at uh, the end of, of our webinar will really dive deep and get granular in some of these, uh, but I'm just setting this up for him. Oxygen really is important for cellular signaling. We talked about growth factors and cytokines and then cell proliferation. So that when those cells come in to the area like fibroblasts, they could replicate, they could lay down collagen, they could support the extracellular matrix and provide that structure that we need to kind of fill in those wounds and contract the wounds. Uh, and then angiogenesis. And, and like I said, Dr. Schultz will really get in to those uh, processes very granularly. But despite this very critical need for oxygen, we typically see that the levels are low. And we already talked about why that would be. And hypoxia leads to a, a decrease in all of the factors that support wound healing, but also can contribute more so to the physical symptom of pain. Basically, your wound is suffocating and pain is the symptom that lets us know we need more oxygen to the wound environment. So we know that pain is often an uh, indication that there's pathophysiology of that chronic wound that hasn't been met. And, and of course, no one therapy works in a vacuum. You, you need to do all the good standard of care processes. You know, Dr. Serena mentioned uh, the run-in period for the randomized controlled trial. You have to offload, you have to compress, you have to hopefully uh, get the patient's comorbidities under control. If they have diabetes, have their A1C managed, uh, and all of those things, debride the wound, uh, make sure that you're treating any sort of infection. But this untreated pain, even after you're doing all of this good standard of care therapy, uh, may be controlled when we add supplemental oxygen uh, via topical oxygen therapy because it will supply a much needed uh, micro nutrient, if you will, uh, to the environment. And we need to really approach pain I think as clinicians, really multifaceted or multi-pronged approach, not just through pain meds at it. And we need to understand the etiology of uh, the wound itself and the etiology and pathophysiology of the pain. So we could try to break that cycle uh, and, and help the wound to really have more oxygen to support the metabolic activities. And we know that the oxygen requirement is, is three times greater in, in wounded tissue, and this leads to pain. So there was an interesting study that came out and was published in, in 2022 that looked at topical oxygen therapy for relieving pain in hard to heal leg ulcers. And this is a small pilot study. It was a retrospective analysis and they looked at patients with severe pain and chronic lower leg wounds. So we already know that chronic lower leg wounds were one of the most painful wounds that the patients reported. And the data was collected retrospectively from 20 patients, and they underwent a treatment with a Natrox topical oxygen therapy device. And the wounds were either venous arterial or mixed venous arterial in nature. And they recorded the patient's pain scales utilizing the pneumatic pain score rating where, uh, you know, zero is no pain and 10 is the worst pain ever. Typically, uh, in this patient cohort, we saw a lot of males. Uh, 14 patients were males and 30% uh, were females. And this is a case example from this publication. This was a 74 year old male, had insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, had this non healing venous leg ulcer for over a year duration. And, and this patient was on many medications. You can see what the patient was taking uh, for pain in, the, in this very uh, painful wound. So patient started a topical oxygen therapy. This is the wound appearance at day six, day 25, day 42, and patient went on to complete wound healing by using topical oxygen by day 86. But I think for the purpose of this talk, what is so impressive is that patient stopped all of those meds for pain. He was on three 
pain medications by day six. So I, I heard Dr. Serena allude to it earlier in his talk that not only is topical oxygen managing pain, it's managing pain like pretty darn quickly with none of the adverse events or side effects that opioids or other pain medications were. So the take home for this uh, study is that 76% of those patients treated with topical oxygen therapy uh, reported substantial pain reduction and 69% stopped opioid use altogether and 53% became completely pain free. And the average pain score in this cohort went from 8.2 to 1.9, which is a significant decrease. And again, very early on in their treatment, usually within a week of treatment. Here's another patient case. This is a 93 year old female. She had a full thickness ulcer of the right lower leg extending to the hypodermis. There's a lot of necrotic tissue, cellulitis, malodor. Uh, the wound was uh, had been treated for uh, a basal cell carcinoma, wide excision, Mohs surgery, and had radiation tissue uh, treatments, uh, 22 radiation tissue, uh, radiation treatments in total. And, and this is what she was left with. Patient was worked up, uh, did a wound assessment, vascular workup, had intervention with angioplasty. They treated the local infection, got rid of the necrotic tissue, and patient then was treated at the wound care center where topical oxygen therapy was performed. And this is what the baseline looked like prior to starting topical oxygen therapy. Patient had significant pain in this wound because it had been present for a very long time. She was very frustrated. She's an older uh, lady, you know, it, it was really taking a toll on her life and her lifestyle. And she had sought a second opinion from this clinic uh, and topical oxygen therapy was started at this point in time. And this is after uh, topical oxygen therapy uh, was uh, performed. This is what week one. And this is throughout the course of her therapy by her second visit her pain went from a 10 to a three and she was able to resume a lot of her activities of daily living, which was, she was pleased to, as punch about volunteering at church was one of those. And then patient went on to complete epithelialization in a total of only three weeks. And she had had this wound for 23 weeks and it had just been plaguing her terribly. So in discussion, we know that the patient journey, uh, it, it can be a steep climb. Uh, living with a chronic wound really controls pretty much every aspect of their life and significantly decreases their quality of life, unfortunately. And it, by controlling this or supporting this and finding ways to help our patients not only heal their wounds, but manage their pain is, is really important. And I think that using topical oxygen therapy and supporting that reversal of the hypoxic conditions that we see in in pretty much all non-healing wounds uh, can support faster healing, uh, can really uh, meet that demand for that supplemental oxygen in the tissue to support wound healing, but then also stimulates the immune response and can decrease inflammation, infection, biofilm, and these all can contribute to that wound pain that the patient is experiencing. So in closing, you know, topical oxygen is an option that supports wound healing, but also can significantly help in managing the pain without any adverse events. And there's no addiction, there is no cytotoxicity. Uh, there, there's really no impact uh, on uh, the patient's ability uh, to perform their activities da of daily living because uh, the device is, is something that could be wearable. So it really supports patient quality of life as well. And so I appreciate your time today. And I hope that this, you know, gives some ideas for patients that you're treating so you can help uh, with their uh, patient progress and their outcomes. Thank you so much. Another excellent presentation. Thank you, Dr. Cole. Thank you. Covered a lot. Um, you know, I think uh, I love the fact that, you know, we can avoid opioid uh, prescriptions, um, you know, when it comes to uh, patient care. Um, we do have a little question uh, from Sonia. Uh, does patient does pain relief from oxygen come from the oxygen effect on the wound healing 
or is there some additional nerve uh, effect? And we all know that opioids. Sleep. Yeah. So the mechanism of action we're not really in tune with yet, right? We're we're looking at performing some other studies to really understand the mechanism of action. Is it is it optimizing the wound environment? like we talked about, and that's, that's our hypothesis, right? You know, it, it, the wound environment is hypoxic for all those reasons we went through. And by applying supplemental oxygen via topical oxygen therapy, it, it's normalizing a, a lot of those uh, factors, right? But is there an effect on the nervous system? Is there a, a effect on, you know, some of these other growth factors and, and, and what effect is it? We don't know yet. Uh, we have a lovely study that we'd love to perform uh, that would give us some of these clues. And we have a grant out to the DOD. So should we be awarded that grant? That's what we want to study to really understand specifically the mechanism of action of, of what's going on. So that's a great question. And, uh, you know, hopefully next year we'll do another webinar and we'll be able to <laughs> Give you those results and get into as, the as more details become available, there'll be more opportunities to share it with you for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> so, what has been your feedback um, on how patients like the treatment modality? Um, you know, they like that it's you know hidden, it's easy, there's no alarms, da, da, da. and then also um, the pain and improvement um, on the wound. And you know, how, how does that? you know, aid to the uh, patient engagement with their own healing process, right? Yeah, well, it's it's really easy for the patient to use. And I think, and clinicians know, if it's too hard or too difficult or the patients have to do, you know, too much heavy lifting, it's just not going to happen, right? Um, so that's what I love about the, the device itself is that it's easy for the patient and it fits into you know, their daily routine very easily. All the patient has to do really is change the battery once a day because this is a battery operated device. So um, it, it's wearable, as you mentioned. So it can be uh, strapped onto the leg, worn on the, in, on the belt loop, or pocket, cover it. You know, people wouldn't even know that you're having this therapy um, and you continue to be mobile, you can work, you can go to church, you can do, you know, pick up your grandkids, you could take care of your parents, whatever, whatever you've got to do in your life. We all have, you know, uh, we wear a bunch of different hats and we have a lot going on. So having a technology that really fits seamlessly into whatever their lifestyle is, I think is truly important. Again, adherence is into any treatment plan is key. And the simpler you make it for the patient, the more adherent they'll be and the better outcomes they'll have. So I, I think it's a huge point. And it decreases the um, dressing changes potentially as well, which I think also supports uh, that pain intolerance that we see with, with dressing changes. Absolutely. Uh, we do have another question. Um, is there any information regarding the likelihood of wound recurrence with the cessation of topical oxygen therapy? Yeah. So Dr. Serena did mention in his talk, we, you know, the RCT uh, with the diabetic foot ulcers, we did do a durability study. So a long-term follow-up study a year afterwards. And actually the patient that the patients that had topical oxygen therapy that led to wound healing were followed in a, in a year and the patients that healed in the standard of care arm were followed in the year and more of the patients that healed with topical oxygen therapy remained healed. So they're actually, our theory is, and of course we can't go out in and do punch biopsies and look at the collagen and all this stuff on these healed patients, although we'd like to. Um, but the theory would be that we're supporting wound healing in a systematic fashion. We're supporting the reduction the regeneration of tissue and the collagen formation. And again, Dr. Schultz will go into this, uh, but the triple helix of collagen, the bonds are oxygen dependent. So we're, we're, that turgor is much better. So the patients are able to withstand stresses. So the recidivism rate has decreased in those patients, which I think is hugely important. So thank you for your question. Cause we know we heal these patients, but man, they tend to have reoccurrence, uh, you know, in a, a month, they're calling us back. So if we can heal them better, uh, quicker and better, 
we're going to be ahead of the game. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Cole. As always, we got to keep this uh, moving. Uh, John and uh, Arezu, uh, we will get to those questions um, in the um, in the roundtable. I'm keeping track of all of those. So we're going to close out now, and uh, we're going to go on to Dr. Wahab's session. Thank you, Dr. Cole. See you soon.